Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock. Be not silent to me, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry unto thee, when I lift up my hands towards thy holy oracle. Draw me not away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity, which speak peace to their neighbours, but mischief is in their hearts. Give them according to their deeds and according to the wickedness of their endeavours. Give them after the work of their hands, render to them their desert. Because they regard not the works of the Lord, nor the operations of his hands. He shall destroy them and not build them up. Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplications. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped therefore, and my heart greatly rejoiced. And with my song will I praise him. The Lord is their strength, and he is the saving strength of his anointed. Save the people and bless thine inheritance. Feed them also and lift them up forever. Selah and Selah. Amen. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Israelite Nation Worldwide Ministries. My name is Davos. I am a member of the UK branch, uh, UK London, Israelite Nation Worldwide Ministries. Smash that like button, put up some seven, some fires. Um, donate to this great cause. Uh, every penny helps. And even if you don't donate, share the videos, spread the message, help us get our God into every living room, onto every TV set or handheld set. Help us share this knowledge. Help us share this teachings that we got from our master teacher, Elder Shadrach, Shadrach Porter. And I would just like to say we have no affiliations with no other Israelite nation or Israelite camps, so-called camps. We are strictly and simply Israelites. We follow the laws, statutes and commandments. And we don't add or put interpretations onto the doctrine. For those that have Come, new, if you're a guest, congratulations, welcome, you've made it. To my brethren, the men of valor, the Israelite nation, the women, the hardworking women, to the children, to the rise members, big up yourselves, because you guys are also our inspiration. To the priesthood and the Supreme Council, also much respect and love to you all because if it weren't for you guys being that driving force, a lot of us would be complacent. And I say this not likely. I've been a member of the Israelite nation for 20 years. And for 20 years, I've realized there has been some ups and there has been some downs. We are dealing with a spiritual set of people. And we are dealing with a God who is or should be served in spirit and in truth. Now this God that I am talking about is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I've said it. That's his name. That's a name that to you may not sound like a name, but that's his name. That's the name that he gave us. Because Moses asked him and said, what name shall the children of Israel, your children, what name shall they call in order to get you? And he said, simply, I am the Lord God of your fathers. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. This is my name. So therefore, that is his name. You may hear me say God of Israel to shorten it up because all of Jacob, well, Jacob was surnamed Israel. 
and all of his children are Israelites. So we're gonna. So I've established that that's the God I serve, and I have only known about this God because of our master teacher, Elder Shadrach. Elder Shadrach has also now said, "Children of slavery, the children that." were taken from their homes, not their indigenous land, but from their home, because they were forced out of their land and forced into exile. And when some went south, majority went across, the, across Europe, settled in Portugal or Spain, down to North Africa and then further down west. And majority of us settled there. Forced, coerced from a set of people who may share our skin colour, but are not us. They were not us. And they sold us to a people which, according to the scriptures, had a fierce countenance and spoke a language that our fathers did not know. And also in turn made us serve a God which was made out of wood and stone. Those children, those people were called the children of Jacob or the children of slavery. Now we short it, simplify it, and we call them Jacobites. And what we want is that our identity is now discovered and also respected because we are a people now I'm not only a Jacobite in fact I'm not a Jacobite because I've come out a Jacobite is somebody who still who had the blood of Abraham Isaac and Jacob but hasn't come out spiritually you're still dead spiritually we're serving strange gods Gods that, as was as I further, as I just mentioned before, our fathers did not know. The amount of um, the amount of Jacobites that you see, say, in Sunday worshiping establishments, I dare call them churches, because they're not churches; they're shrines. They're places that worship the dead. My God is the God of the living. And when I see the amount of Jacobites still trapped in those organizations, these are one of the reasons why I implore anyone listening to share this message. Get it out to the world that we can return back to our God. Back to where we should be. In Rome, the Roman Empire, they had quite a well established spiritual system. The most popular one today is the Catholic, or the Roman Catholic, I dare say, church. In this establishment, they claim to have 10,000 saints. Now, these saints are called saints because the popes or the previous popes have ordained them as saints when they died, because they brought Christianity to the country. So, for example, the Irish have St. Patrick, St. Paddy, and they go crazy over St. Patrick's Day because he brought Christianity to Ireland. The English in England, London, where I am today, we have uh, St. Paul, and I think we have St. George as well. Correct me if I'm wrong. And these so-called saints, I tell you now, are no saints. 
there are no saints of the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And I also say, no man, I don't care who you are, has the authority to ordain anybody as a saint. All the saints that are written, whether alive, walking, or resting, or working, I should really say, are Israelites. That's not to say all Israelites are saints. I hope one day I qualify to be a saint. I hope I don't take this doctrine, this teaching, this knowledge, this blessing I have for granted. And I hope I can be used in a good way because you can be used in a bad way. So I hope I can be used in a good way to get my father's message out there to get or to bring back his people and whoever wants to listen or understand. Because this is not a black thing. This is a truth thing. The race or my ethnicity is that I'm an Israelite. That's it. My colour, my melanin, that's another story. I share a melanin which many people share. But my ethnicity or my race, really, or the tribes that I'm from, is from Israel, from kings, from great men, great men that people read in the scriptures on a daily basis. I'm going to turn to Matthew chapter 23. Because I want to continue this conversation in regards to saints. And I don't want to just speak, but I need to prove that we are the saints. That the saints were only the Israelites. So I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 23 from the first verse. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, <coughs> that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. In other words, they're hypocrites. They tell you to do something, but they themselves don't do it. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen of men, they make broad their... I always get this word wrong. Flecketeries. And enlarge the borders of their garments. So in other words, they sit on the highest seat. They look down at people. They walk with their, their chest high. Because they believe, well, the people believe that they're men of God. And therefore, they feel that they're on the highest realm. And they should be worshipped. Verse 6. And love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. So they really want to, they really want everyone to know who they are. And greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. No one's a rabbi today. The only true rabbi or true master we have today is Christ Jesus, as it's written. We are all brethren. Verse 9, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. So, 
we have clearly there's an establishment that calls their teachers rabbis. And for the argument's sake, there's an establishment, because I'm going to get more into that establishment, which is the Catholic Church. And they call their so-called priests father. The Pope is actually called Holy Father. And this so-called person who, whether inadvertently, or I actually believe it's pure wickedness and it's on purpose, is trying to take the position or replace the Most High God of Israel and has men calling him Father. But Christ has already warned us, call no man Father. So this was happening before and clearly that tradition has continued. It reminds me the, the characteristics of somebody who clearly wanted to be like the Most High. He'd adversary. The number six. He wanted also to sit on the throne, on the highest throne, on the heavens, on the seventh heaven, on the heavens of heavens. And he wanted for all to worship him. The similarities of the Catholic Church or the Pope and the other side is almost too true and too similar for anyone to deny. So this Pope, he ordains men or women who bring this philosophy of Christianity to your country, or does a deed, a Christian action deed for that cause, and he will then label them possibly a saint. Well, only God can do that. Further, only Israel are the saints. And I will keep repeating this. Let me turn... Let us turn to Psalms 50. Because I have to prove what I say. And I'm going to read from the third verse. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. In other words, when the God of Israel comes, you make way. Make way. Because you don't make way, you're gonna, and you get caught in that fire, you're finished. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Who are his people? It says, verse 5, Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by a sacrifice. Who are the people that have made a covenant with the God of Israel? Israel. It began with the progenitor, the father Abraham, that custom or that tradition continued and became law throughout the generations of Israel. That on the eighth day, the male children shall be circumcised. And that's the establishment of the covenant, the circumcision. So it says in verse four, I'll repeat, he shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by my sacrifice. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 33. I'm going to home in the point and home in the point and home in the point that only the saints, only Israel are the saints. 
And I'm going to keep homing in on the point. Deuteronomy chapter 33, and I'll read from the first verse. And this is the blessings wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. Moses didn't bless everyone. Moses blessed those that he knew. He blessed his family. He blessed the children of Israel, the Israelites. And he said, the Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran and he came with 10,000 of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law <coughs> for them. Sorry. <coughs> so he said, he came with 10,000 of saints from his right hand, went a fiery law for them. Who were the laws given to? Israel. Verse 3. Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand, and they sat down at thy feet. Everyone shall receive of thy words. He loved his people. My father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, loves his people, does not love everyone out there. Let's dispel that myth right now. If there's any um, actions, I don't like saying Christian, actions out there watching, I'm glad you're watching. But this is the harsh reality. This God is a God of truth. He loves, but he loves his people. He doesn't love everyone. He doesn't love the world. And his people, he refers to them, those that he can call upon, those that he can commune with or will work for him effortlessly, tirelessly. Men that are running rides or men that are running this great Israelite nation worldwide ministries. My heavenly father depends on them. He depends on you. He depends on me to get this message out. He calls us, those that are working, those that are worthy saints. I'm going to continue homing in on the, on the point. We're going to turn to Psalms 148. At Psalms 148. And I'm going to read from the first verse. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Everything has a purpose and everything follows its path, its purpose, its instruction that was given. The sun doesn't deviate. The moon doesn't deviate. The only people or the only things, unfortunately, that deviates are the children of Israel. Verse 5, let them praise the name of the Lord for he commanded and they were created. His words, he said, let there be light. He said, let there be earth, animals, beasts, the stars, the moon. Isn't he a great God? What God can do these things? Verse 6, he had also established them forever and ever he has made a decree which shall not pass. Praise the Lord from the earth, ye dragons and all deeps, fire and hell, snow and vapour, stormy wind fulfilling his words, mountains and all hills, fruit, um, fruitful trees and cedars, beasts and cattle, creeping things, flying fowls, kings of the earth and all people, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. 
His glory is above the earth and heaven. He also exalteth the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints. Even, this is the part where you could read it with me, even of the children of Israel, a people near unto him, praise ye the Lord. He doesn't mention no other nation. He doesn't care for any other nation. All he cares for is for his children. And all he wants his children to do is to praise him, follow his instructions, keep his laws, his statutes and his commandments. Granted, granted, the laws, statutes and commandments. Not no easy task. Not no easy road. I myself, many times, have fallen. I myself had to pick myself up or depend on my, my fellow brothers and sisters to help pick me up. This road is not easy. But the instructions are clear. The true and living God expects the best for his children. And I'm sick and tired of hearing us complain about things that we don't have. I understand when I hear the heathens or the people that don't believe in my God complain about things that they don't have. I even feel sorry for them. I even try to, to, to show them the power of the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And that power comes through prayer. I try to share, or even sometimes I may even give one of elders books so that they can read and obtain knowledge, but not for their own gain, but for so that they can use the knowledge and spread it and come into the fold of this nation and help our Supreme Council build my God's kingdom. This glory, we are supposed to be his glory. Israel, the saints are supposed to be the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob's glory. I'm going to read a book in Jeremiah, but before I read Jeremiah, I'd like to uh, I'd like to say something. So, as I was saying, I've been in this nation for around 20 years. And when I first joined, or when I first heard about the Israelite nation, I was marveled. I was marveled and amazed because every question I had, the answers came directly from the book. And I was a stubborn person. I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't a Muslim neither. I, you can kind of call me a floater. I was everything, basically. I was everything but what I should be. And I really truly believed that mankind, I mean, I wasn't really a good person. Some may say I'm still, I'm still not a good person. That's fine. But I truly believed that so long as mankind lived a so-called good life, we'll be okay, you know. There's a, there's a heaven and we should go to heaven. Oh, where was I wrong? First and foremost, when I heard about the Israelite nation and elders' teachings and how digestible it was, I did everything in my power to try and justify my old ways and try and prove 
this nation was wrong. I was proud to be an Israelite, but I knew being an Israelite meant sacrifice. It meant change. It meant commitment. It meant I couldn't just go there, sit down, listen to the priest speak and go home and go eat pork and go on yam, uh, lobster and thing like that and, and say, yeah, everything good. Yes, everything all right, I'm an Israelite. I, I knew I couldn't do that. I knew I had a purpose. I had a, a mission. And I was now chosen or called, because I may not have been chosen. I'll say I was called. But first and foremost, to work. This is a plea to my brethren who aren't working, but are Israelites and have baptized with me. We have to work. Because I see all these other nations out there and they work. They work tirelessly for a God that is not a God or gods that are not gods. I've just shown, and there's many more scriptures, and the speaker that comes after me, she will give many, many more scriptures in regards to the saints and she'll say it in a much more eloquent way than I am. But I've shown examples that we are his people that are near to him. Imagine that. We are near to the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The God that created everything. The heaven and the earth. The sun, the moon, the stars. Everything pays homage and respects to this God. And he chose out of all the nations, he chose us. Why can't we choose him? Why can't we return back to him? What? Why are we here, there, everywhere? I digress anyway. I digress, as I always do. So, when I was, yeah, 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 I'm an Israelite now. I'm an Israelite, you know. I, I, I've got over, I'm, I'm over the, the, uh, the infatuations of those bad habits that I had in the past. I'm now a new man, baptized, you know, I've got my guns, you know, I'm ready for war. I remember feeling unique. I remember feeling no one knows exactly who I am or what I am or what I can achieve, but I'm going to show them. And I remember seeing with my own eyes, fellow brethren, elevate from the gutter to great things because they're serving the same God that I serve. And I remember feasting and rejoicing with them. I remember people used to look at me and say, you've changed. You're different. And I remember like flinging my, my star of David, well, double triangle. Some, some people call it star of David and flinging it in their face. I wanted them to know, yeah, 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 I am different. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely different. Oh, well, what are you? Are you a Jew? You can call me that if you want to. I'll be more specific. I'm an Israelite. Under the Elder Shadrach flock. And I remember it was so, it was such a great feeling to feel unique and special and to know my purpose. The purpose of man is to serve God, but not any God. The one true and living God. And when I say man, I'm talking about the Israelite man. I'm talking about the Jacobites. And I'm talking about any man or, or woman who is hearing this voice and is listening to this lesson 
and wants to be a part of this great nation. I'm going to read something. Um, I did say I'll go to Jeremiah. So we're going to go to Jeremiah, the second chapter. This chapter is hard for me to read. Because when I read the scriptures, I don't read the scriptures and, yeah, I've read the scriptures, you know, verbatim. No, 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 no. I'm reading, it's, it's almost like reading about yourself or reading about the people that you see today. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask if we can all turn to Jeremiah chapter 2. And like I said, this actually is a hard scripture for me to read. So from the first verse. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem saying, thus said the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness in the land that was not sown. Wow. God remembers us. He remembers when we called upon him, when we begged for him and asked for him and he helped us and he was there with us. And the, spirit, the spiritual connection was great. He remembers those times. This is the true and living God. This is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. This is what he's saying. Verse 3. Israel was holiness unto the Lord. Like, I don't take that for granted. I don't take that lightly. Israel were holiness unto him. No other people. And the first fruits of his increase we multiplied. Uh, we prospered. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come, evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. So you know I'm speaking to all. I'm reading this to Israel. I'm reading this to the Jacobites. I'm reading this to anyone who listens. Verse 5. Thus said the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me? that they are gone far from me and have walked after vanity and are become vain. I'm going to say this. I'm going to paraphrase this. God's saying, what fault have we found in him that we have distanced ourselves from him? What fault, what has he done wrong to us? The humility, the meekness of one so powerful is incredible. He said, uh, they are gone far from me and have walked after vanity and are become vain. Vanity, things that cannot prosper you. Nice things you want. These nations have big, big Houses with big, fat, chubby, fat Buddhas in front of them. They want that. Or they want big obelisks or big statues or whatever. Or nice, whatever, nice shoes, nice clothes, whatever it is. Whatever it is that we put in front of him. You know, if you put something in front of God and you, and that becomes more important to you than God, that becomes your God. Verse 6, Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts, and of pits, through a land of drought, and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through 
and where no man dwelt. That in itself was an amazing feat because um, I remember looking on the maps, looking when we where the Red Sea is and, and Egypt and where the desert is. And then the, 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 the neighboring lands, which we, well, it's the land of Canaan, which became Israel. And the journey that we would have taken to get there and where we were. And to be honest with you, man wouldn't really survive in those times. There was a force behind us that led us in the night and led us in the daytime that guided us and protected us from all these all the surrounding enemies. We were, we were like, oh, I forgot the saying, but we were like bait, uh, cheddar for the, for the fish. Can't remember the saying. We were like open targets, but yet we couldn't be touched. Touch not thine anointed. We could not be touched. Only because we had the power of the God of Abraham, the living God behind us, the God of Israel. Verse 7, and I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and of the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made mine inheritance an abomination. We defiled not our land. We defiled his land because he gave it to us. And when he gave us that land, it already had the stuff that we needed, the substance that we needed to prosper. We didn't have to do much. You see how spoiled we were as children. That's how much our God loved us. We didn't have to do much. We go in there, we big up our chest, we take. Our God's got our backs. Some wars we didn't even fight. Some wars the unseen fought for us. Verse 8, the priest said not, where is the Lord? And they that handled the Lord knew me not. So what happened? Did we forget? Of course, we forgot. The pastors also transgressed against me and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that did not profit. Baal is just another name for a strange God or an idol, a Canaanite God or gods. Because it could be a, 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 new, a, a number of or a collection of gods. It may not necessarily be one. But no matter what it was, it wasn't something that we can prosper or profit from. Do you guys not notice? Listen to me, Israel, or anyone out there listening to me. Listen, do we not notice that other nations prosper when serving their gods? The Khazars. Khazars known as Jewish, people that follow Judaism. They prosper serving their God or gods. The Catholics, Christians, whatever denomination you are, they prosper serving their gods. And yes, I say gods because they themselves say they have three gods. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Gods. The Chinese, Buddha, the Hindus, Ram and Sita and or there are many other gods. The Muslims, they're, they're gods. All these nations prosper, doing what they're supposed to do. That's fine. But the saints, we can never prosper serving strange gods. Verse 9, Wherefore I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. Plead, he's, he's begging now. For pass over the hours of Chittim and see and send unto Kedar and, con and consider diligently and see if there be such a thing. 
I'm going to read that again because I kind of butchered those names, right? Pass over the Isles of Chittim. Go to Chittim. And see and send unto Ke Kedar. Go to Kedar. And consider diligently. Now look carefully, diligently. And see if there be such a thing. And tell me, this is the God of Israel saying, tell me if there's such a thing as this, what I'm about to read now, right? Verse 11, have a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods. Has a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their, their glory for that which does not profit. This is insane. This, when you read this, and I listen to, I listen to the, the lessons uh, given last week by Elder Kurt and Elder Jeffrey, and the lesson before that, and the lesson before that, uh, Pre Story and Elder Michael, and the lesson before that, they're all saying the same thing. They're, well, they're all pleading, come back unto your God, unto the one and only true and living God. Because if you want to, you wonder why there's so many of us in prisons. You wonder why there's so many of us not doing too great in school. Not, so many of us selling drugs. So many of us, we call it road, on the road, road man. So many of us doing things that doesn't prosper and doesn't, doesn't reward us. And we look around and we're like, are we just here just to be rappers or athletes? Is there not a greater purpose for each and every single one of us? Why is it that all these other nations have big houses, have a unity, have an identity? My elder Shadrach has come here and he has said, you guys should no longer call yourselves African-American or African-Caribbean or, or whatever, but call yourself Jacobites because you are the children of Jacob. But people sigh. People frown. People look down and think, what are we talking about? Well, what we're talking about is we're trying to reconnect and give you back your purpose. Eventually, eventually, we want we would like if you called yourselves Israelites. But in order to do so, you need to know the true and living God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the one and only God I keep on stressing. I cannot stress anymore. Because every nation has their gods. We need to return back to our, our God. Okay, I'm going to wrap up with Ephesians chapter 4. So I do this, so I go to the First Testament and I go to the Second Testament and back and forth. The reason why I do this is because it's a complete book. And I don't want anybody to say, oh, we don't read the New Testament or Second Testament. Yeah, we read the whole book. In fact, I challenge Christians and say, do you guys even read the Old Testament? Do you guys even read the First Testament? Sorry. And if you did, then you would know who we are. And you would know that there was a beginning. Even Jesus the Christ was born an Israelite from an Israelite mother, from an Israelite father. Even Jesus was an Israelite. Ephesians chapter 4. And I think I have about 10 minutes. Is that correct? Yeah.
And I'm going to read from the first verse. You'll probably notice a trend I like to read from the first verse. And I'll wrap it up with this. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Now this is a direct message, I believe, to anyone that is listening. To the saints first, Israel, and for all those who want to be a part of this fold. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. I repeat, there is one body and one Spirit. Even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. One Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, and his begotten son. One faith, the belief of him, the belief of his begotten son, the belief of this truth, the belief of the doctrine that has been brought to us by Elder Shadrach. And one baptism, very important as well. I've heard people say to me, I'm already baptized, oh, Davos. Do I need to baptize again? Or did you baptize under the banner of the Israelite nation? Because if you baptize under that banner, you're my brethren. But if you didn't baptize under that banner, then there was not a baptism. Because there is no baptism unless it's under the Israelite nation. Whatever else you're doing, as Elder Michael would say, is foolishness. One, verse six, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. And I'll stop there. I hope today at the very least, my words have touched some. At the very least. At the very least, I also hope today this video gets shared and it, touch, it touches anyone and that they inquire about the Israelite nation and they post comments or they go on the website www.israelitenation.com and they read, and they read the scriptures, and they read the book, and they pose questions, and they be inquisitive. You only have one life, so it says, right? YOLO, you only live once, right? That's what, that's what it says. So make this life count. Don't waste it. Don't waste another second. You have front row seats to the summit, to, to some of the finest teachers, some of the finest teachers. When I was younger, 20 years ago, as I mentioned, I never had this opportunity. I, I'm not afraid to say I don't believe YouTube existed when I was 20, 20 years ago. Well, that shows my age. I don't think there was a YouTube 20 years ago. So you have all this technology, utilize it, make good of it. I'd like to thank everyone for listening and coming out today. Smash that like. Make sure you press subscribe and, and the bell button. Give me some sevens and some fire emojis and whatever emojis that you feel is going to benefit and uplift others. Put it on. Put it on the live chat. Let's start some dialogue. Let's di dialogue. Let's start some discourse and Let's get this nation moving and let's get back our, our identity and let's make our God proud. I'd like to introduce the next speaker. You're going to hear some words now and you're going to hear a lesson now.
Now you're going to hear somebody who's a bit more eloquently spoken than me. She's going to go into more detail as to what I just previously said about saints. So I leave the floor for her and I bid you all peace. Peace. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust, all my soul. Thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord. My goodness extendeth not to thee, but to the saints that are in the earth, and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God, and their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their name into my lips. The Lord is a portion of mine inheritance, and of my cup thou maintainest my lot. The lines have fallen unto me in pleasant places, yes, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night season. I set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, and I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will I suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Selah and Selah. Amen. Peace, brethren, and once again, welcome to the Israelite Nation Worldwide Ministries. We are speaking to you today and coming to you from the UK branch. Wow, I have to say, you know, it's always an honour to be able to stand up and speak amongst my fellow brethren who are excellent, excellent teachers. And moreover, you know, it's great to see the spirit of truth, even the comfort of working itself among us um, across the world. You know, so oftentimes, you know, we may have given a lesson here or picked up some scriptures here in the UK, and then we will watch our brethren abroad and we'll be like, oh, they're in the book of Acts. Oh, they were talking about Peter. I was talking about Peter. And you, we are always witness to see in the comfort of the spirit of truth working itself among the teachers, the witnesses of the Most High God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And truly, that's what we are. We are vessels. You know, we are vessels um, used to communicate this message, this doctrine, this truth among all nations of the earth. And truly, you know, we have to praise the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob for even leaving with us that spirit, that comforter, that Jesus Christ said that he would leave for his people, Israel, who were given the authority to teach these scriptures. So I always find joy in watching my brethren share this doctrine. I always find joy. You know, it's never easy just to come up and speak. Some people say, oh, you know, it comes so naturally. But it doesn't always come so naturally. But sometimes you have to surrender to the spirit and allow the comfort to do its job so that we can just teach. Well, today, brethren, I want to speak to you about saints. Yes, that's what I want to speak to you. And I always open up my lessons with Psalm 16. And in Psalm 16... It talks about the goodness that is extended to the saints that are in the earth. So my question to you all today is, who are the saints? I know that when I was growing up, or in my younger years, I only really came into the awareness of saints when it came to certain celebrations that took place socially. So I was aware of things like Valentine's Day and I understood things like St. Valentine. I remember in the UK here we would um, recognize and celebrate this day called St. Patrick's Day. Okay and this is where my first encounter of the word saints came up. 
it was through the practices and celebrations and holidays that are kept in the world today. So obviously now as an Israelite, it has come to my attention who the saints really are. It has come to my attention that Israel, the Israelites, are the saints of the Most High God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And never, never, never in my lifetime would I have imagined that I'd be standing here declaring that we are the saints. Because my understanding of saints was that they were people that looked, I did something, guys. People that look like this. So let me show you. I have some pictures today. So I took this from the internet, and this is a picture of Saint Valentine, as you understand it, if you can see that very closely. And then I decided I'm going to print a few of these stuff. And here is Saint Nicholas. Who does that remind you of? Saint Nicholas. So guys, you can go onto the internet and just print these pictures the same way that I have. And I remember growing up and believing that saints look something like this. Certainly did not look like me. So we're all familiar with Saint Valentine. We're all familiar, if not, with Saint Valentine. And we're definitely familiar with February the 14th, which is Valentine's Day. And everybody wants a Valentine's card, and every woman wants a bunch of flowers and some chocolates and wants to be told how much they are loved and appreciated. And some, for some people, you know, Valentine's Day can be a very lonely time when they don't get those flowers, they don't get those chocolates, they don't get wined and dined and taken out. So Valentine, this person is known as a saint, and he was a third century Roman commemorated in Christianity on the 14th of February. And in the Eastern Orthodox, he's commemorated on July the 6th. And this was a celebration, a commemoration that was established in 496 by Pope Galatius. Pope Galatius in 496. And St. Valentine is known um, as somebody that um, stands for courtly love. That's what it is, courtly love. So St. Valentine is commemorated for that. Hence Valentine's Day, guys. You know, so often people say, no, no, I am not religious. They say, I'm not religious. However, they're ignorant to the fact that most of the celebrations and the holidays, the festivities that we keep, or that the world keep as a tradition, is based from Christian um, beliefs, traditions, um, things that they, they do. It all comes from their um, philosophy, okay, which they call religion. So we are familiar with St. Valentine. So here in the UK, we have something called St. Patrick's Day. And that is a celebration of the arrival of Christianity to Ireland. And it commemorates and it celebrates Irish culture. Okay? So St. Patrick, he stands for... Um, it stands for the celebration of Christianity coming into the into Ireland. Okay, but you can find so much more detail of this on the internet, guys. I'm just touching it there, but it has so much to do with Irish culture. But I remember growing up and celebrating St. Patrick's Day or at school, the tellers it was St. Patrick's Day. All right, and then we have the one here called. Let me see. St. Nicholas. Who does that look like? He's dressed in red. <laughs> He's dressed in red. Well, St. Nicholas is associated with Santa Claus. You know him as Santa Claus. 
and St. Nicholas is called St. Nicholas of Myra, uh, sometimes known as Nicholas of Bari, and he was a Christian bishop of Greek descent, and these were in the times and during the times of the Roman Empire. He was Nicholas the Wonder Worker, is what the internet will tell you. So he was a patron for sailors, merchants, archers, um, repentant at Thebes, um, for children, unmarried people. So he would help the needy. And that's what he was known for, helping the needy and giving gifts to the needy. Hence today we have Santa Claus, Christmas, the 25th of December, where the same person is dressed in red with the white beard and the white hair judging children as to whether they're good or bad. But if you look in the internet, you will see that it's associated with Saint Nicholas. Again, Christian religion coming from the Catholic beliefs and traditions. So there you have it, guys. So I have one thing I want you to share too. If you look at this one, again, I'm going back to St. Valentine. On this, I don't know if you can see it, but I'll read it. It says, and the spiritual life of Christians must now be conducted under the conditions of secular life. Let me say that to you again. This is supposed to be St. Valentine. And this is a scroll in his hand. And it says, and the spiritual life of Christians must now be conducted under the conditions of secular life. What Christianity realised is they needed to find a way to put their religious beliefs, so we understand it's, you know, philosophy, but to put it into secular life. And this is exactly what has been done. And this is exactly why people today will turn and say, well, I'm not religious. Just because I celebrate Christmas doesn't mean I'm religious. Just because I celebrate Valentine's Day does not mean I'm religious. It's because they found a cunning way to put these things in to secular life and almost make it appear non-religious or non-Christian. But its roots is founded within their doctrine and their way of life. So these are the things that I was taught that many of you have been taught. And when you think about the saints, you never think about somebody that looks like me, potentially having any, any, any thought of anyone like us potentially being saints. But I'm here to declare to you today that actually, Israel, we are the saints. Saints come from the camp of Israel and they remain in the camp of Israel. Whether they are Israelites that have passed away or Israelites that are still living today. Now among us, in our culture, in our Israelite community, we do not turn around and call each other saints, no. It's not something that we traditionally say to one another. Oh, Saint Charmaine. Oh, saint this one, saint that one, absolutely not. But among our forefathers and mothers in the past, it was just standard, it was just natural. We are saints because if you really think about what the word saint means, it means holy person. It means that you're a person who was considered close to God. Okay? So if you think about the... 12 apostles, they were close to the Creator. They were close to the, very, very close to Jesus of Christ because they were with Him. Okay, so they're very close to the Son of God. And in fairness, you will hear about St. Peter. They do talk about St. Peter. And if you read the book of Acts and you read the Second Testament, you will know about Peter, that he was an apostle, and Peter. I was very close to um, Jesus of Christ. We've, you know, given lessons on that. Um, if you listen to the lesson um, from Elder Michael, Priest Doring, um, Philosophy versus Religion, or the lesson that I've given 
um, in relation to Israel teaches all nations. You will have heard a lot about Paul and Peter um, and their role. And you will see that, you know, Paul definitely was a teacher to the Gentiles. And so the, we have heard of Saint Paul. They've made Paul into a saint and they've made um, Peter into a saint um, according to their beliefs. Now, I've said that slightly wrong, made them into a saint. Well, actually, they got that part right. <laughs> if you consider that Paul was a teacher to the Gentiles and Paul was from the tribe of Benjamin and Israelite, yes, it would be fair and right for them to consider Paul a saint. It would be fair and right for them to consider Peter who went to see Cornelius, who Cornelius sent for. It would be right for him, Cornelius, to call Peter a saint because they were holy men. They were Israelites. But it seems like there's been a development that now all sorts of people are being given this platform and being called saints. And that is where you take something that was holy and you make it something else that is no longer holy. Even if you read the scripture and you go into the book of Acts, for example, Acts chapter 9, verse 13 mentions the saints that are in Jerusalem, okay? Acts chapter 9, verse 32, it mentions when Peter went to see the saints that are in Lydda. When Ananias was told to go and meet Paul on the road to Damascus, when Paul was just given the enlightenment that he needed to go and teach the Gentiles, Ananias said unto the Lord, but have you heard about the things that this guy Paul has done to the saints that are in Jerusalem. So guys, check out Acts 9, verse 13, Acts 9, verse 32. But I'd like to share with you a psalm. If you could turn your Bibles, please, to Psalms 149. Psalms 149. Let all praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise in the congregation of the saints. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and the harp. For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Verse 5. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises to God be in their mouth and the two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishment upon the people. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute upon them the judgment written, this honour have all his saints. Praise ye the Lord. Salah and Salah. Amen. If you really break down and you take a close look at Psalms 149, it is telling the saints to sing unto the Lord a new song to praise the Lord in the congregation of the saints. Let's praise the Lord in the congregation of those who are close to him. Let's praise the Lord in the congregation of those who are considered holy. Now, in order to be holy, you need to know what unclean is. You need to understand separation. You need to understand the difference between that which is clean 
and that which is unclean. And if you know the laws of our God and you look and you read the books of Leviticus, you'll understand separation. We understand separation. We know what things to do to ensure that our vessels are prepared for things that are holy. And we also know that when we go out into the world, into the secular world, and are doing non-holy things, we know that it would be okay to drink a small bit of wine. It's okay. I'm not doing anything holy. I can have a glass of wine today. It's not my new moon. It's not my Sabbath. I'm not standing before the congregation and teaching the people about my father. So therefore, I can have a glass of wine. But if I am to teach God's people, if I am to do things that are holy, I know how to prepare my vessels and I will surely keep away from the wine because I understand separation, clean and unclean. And if you don't understand the difference between that which is clean and that which is unclean, you have nothing to do or you'll have no understanding in regards to that which is holy and considered holy. Back to Psalms 149. In verse 1, when it says, and his praises in the congregation of the saints, verse 2 says, let Israel rejoice in him that made him. So it tells you who the saints are. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king, the king of Israel. Let them praise his name in dance. Let them sing praises unto him. So he's talking about the way we praise our God. We sing and we dance and we, we, we hit the harp and the timbrel and we play instruments and we worship our God. That's what the saints do. That's what Israel does, according to Psalms 149. Because the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He said in verse 5, let the saints be joyful. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. Listen, and a two-edged sword in their hand. So even though we praise our God, we have the ability, the authority to have the two-edged sword in our hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen. Who? Adam? So who were the heathen and, and who were the saints? Again, the scripture is showing separation between those who are considered heathen, non-holy, non-godly, non-saints, to those who are saints. And punishment upon the people, the heathen, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. To execute judgment, execute upon them the judgment written, this honour, this honour have all his saints. So for those who do not worship our God, if they be enemies unto us, even the heathen that don't know the difference between that which is holy and that which is clean and non-clean, these are the things that we can do in the name of our God. So there, there is also a separation. And I just wanted to show you Psalms 149. And I want you to think about that for one moment. I want you to think about that. Children of Jacob. Jacobites. Could it be true that you your forefathers are the saints, Jacobites. Could it be true that your forefathers went out to teach all nations this doctrine, this gospel of truth, that it was your forefathers who were considered the teachers, the preachers, the holy men, the holy women. Is 
even in your state of being Jacob, children of slavery, from saint to slave. Imagine this. From saint with a duty, with the privilege and honor of teaching this gospel of truth, of calling yourself the children of the most high God. Could it be true that these are now the children that fell so low from saint to slave? And whilst we fell to our own demise, we now have a nation of Gentiles giving us these celebrations and these customs that we should not be keeping, honouring their selves as the saints in this world, looking like this, looking like that. So here we have their so-called Paul, on the road to Damascus when Jesus comes to tell him to go and teach the Gentiles. So Paul, an Israelite from the tribe of Benjamin, from Jerusalem, has had a skin color change because this is not the way that the Paul written about in this Bible could have looked. This is not the Jesus of Nazareth that is right written about in this book. They've written or drawn visuals in their own likeness and image. First of all, Israelites, we do not draw images and likenesses and stand before them and worship them. We don't have no kind of image of a Jesus and then put our hands up to worship any kind of an image. For anybody that does their research, geography, studies geography will know that Jesus the Christ would only have had dark, skin. A white Jesus never hid in a black Egypt. He would have stood, up, stood out like a sore thumb. <laughs> Jesus, a white Jesus in a black Egypt. Now, they all have dark skin, they were all black people. But because we fell because we lost sight of who we were, because for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, we've had the slave master telling us who we are. We've been indoctrinated by the slave master. We've been made to believe that they are the saints, that the Gentiles are the saints. But yet Paul went to teach the Gentiles. And in Israel, Paul was least among them. The Israelites. He was least among the Israelites. He was least a get among the Israelites. It's okay. They did that part right. Paul was an Israelite. Yes, you could call him a saint. I don't know who Valentine is. And I don't know who Patrick is. And there's a whole list of these saints that you could look up on the internet who are not Israelites and who have no relationship with the God that's written about in this Bible. Let's turn our scriptures, guys, to Romans. Romans chapter 15. Let's go to Romans chapter 15, guys. And I'm going to read 
from this. Wherefore receive you one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now you have the teacher of the Gentiles speaking to the Romans. Paul is speaking to the Romans and those Israelites that were among the Romans at the time. Wherefore receive you one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God. Paul himself is saying that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promise made unto the fathers, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, for this cause I will confess thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. Meaning I will confess the Son of God, Jesus of Christ, unto the Gentiles. The Gentiles get to know the word of the Son of God. Through Paul, by Paul. But Christ Jesus himself, he came to minister to the Israelites because they were the ones of circumcision, not the Gentiles. And again he said, rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. Listen, rejoice you Gentiles with his people. So who were his people? If you are to rejoice with God's people who I believe must be the saints because you're God's people, meaning you're godly, then who are these people? And how come you haven't drawn pictures of his people? How come you've drawn pictures of people that look like you? And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and Lord him, all you people. And again, Isaiah saith, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. So he's talking, verse 12 is talking about a prophecy of old given by Elisha which saith, there shall be a root of Jesse. Now we know that King David came from the root of Jesse. And we know that according to the scriptures throughout, it says that Jesus was the son of David. Now you need to know your scriptures to see this, because then you're going to get confused with Mary and Joseph. And then you're going to get confused with the son of God. But he's talking about the lineage of Israel, the leaders in Israel, talking about the, the kingship, the kin according to the flesh as well. And he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. So we know that today, that is, that's real. The Gentiles talk about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I praise Jesus, I praise Jesus, I praise Jesus. This is what the Gentiles do. They don't talk about the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. They don't talk about the God of Israel, who is Jesus the Christ's father. But they trust in Jesus. The prophecy, the Bible is real, right? Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. And I myself am persuaded of you, my brethren, that you are also full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Remember, Paul is talking. He's saying, I've spoken more boldly to you, Romans, because of the job I have to do. That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost, by being sanctified by the Spirit of Truth. I have therefore, whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ have not wrote by me, to, to make the Gentiles obedient by word 
and deed. I really want you to say this part. Listen to it, verse, four, verse 18. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ have not wrought by me, have not given me the authority to speak, to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. The Gentiles, you know, there is so much talk about the Gentiles. All they have to do is have faith. All they have to do is have faith. Yes, they had to have faith in the words that Paul spoke to them about Jesus the Christ. Of course, they had to believe what Paul was telling them about Jesus Christ. That's what it means. They had to have faith in the words that an Israelite gave to them about the Son of God, Jesus the Christ. But the scripture here is saying that they also had to be obedient, not just by words, but by deeds by actions. When you go about to make a whole nation of people look like you, Gentiles, and then you say that they are the saints, when you go about to paint who was supposed to be a black man, Jesus, a black man, Paul, and you go about to paint them white so that they look like your people, then you seek to take away the truth or at least the people that gave you the word of truth. You seek to, to hide their contribution to your knowledge, even though you take knowledge and you run away with it and do what you want to do with it. But if you were obedient Gentiles, you would be worshipping the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the name of the Christ, in word and in deed. Deed means your actions. And yet you say, oh no, we don't need to circumcise. We just need to believe in our heart. We just need to confess that Jesus is Lord and Saviour. So you keep confessing that Jesus is Lord and Saviour, but what are your actions doing contrary to what he did and contrary to his instructions? You are doing contrary to what the saints told you you must do. I'm going to jump to verse 25. So I, I stopped at verse 18. I'll go to verse 24. Whensoever I take my journey, Paul is still talking, into Spain. So Paul is saying, whenever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you. For I trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way thitherward by you. If first I be somewhat filled with your company. But now, verse 25, Paul is saying, but now I go on to Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. I'll say it to you again. He is talking to the Gentiles. He's talking to the Romans. He's saying that he wants to take a journey to Spain and that he will come to them. Um, but right now, he's on his way to Jerusalem, which is his homeland, to minister unto the saints. What is he going to tell his fellow brethren who are the saints? in Jerusalem. Listen to what he says. For it hath pleased them to Macedonia and Asia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are in Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. What Paul, what, um, Paul is basically saying is, look, there are some faithful Gentiles that he knows from Macedonia and Asia, okay? And they want to make a contribution to the saints, the Israelites, who are in Jerusalem. 
the ones who are more physically poorer, meaning they don't have a lot of money. These people of Macedonia and Asia, these Gentiles, want to contribute to them financially. So Paul is going to Jerusalem to give them this news. Look, we've got these Gentile believers. They believe in our doctrine. They believe in Jesus of Christ. They believe in everything I've said about our people, our God, our culture. And they want to make a donation to the saints in Jerusalem. That's what you're saying. And Paul is then going to justify it by saying, look, well, if we have given to them spiritual things, spiritual richness in teaching them about Jesus of Christ, in teaching them about the God of Israel, in teaching them about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Samuel, Daniel, David. If we've taught them these spiritual things and shared with the spiritual riches that we have, then we should be able to share with them in the carnal things. This is what the scripture says, verse 27, in the materialistic, worldly things, such as money. Do you see what the scripture is saying? So Paul is feeling good about this. Look, it's give and take. We give them spiritual things. Some of them have some money. They can help the, the, the poorer saints in Jerusalem. That's what they want to do. Verse 28. When therefore I perform this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you to Spain. Says, and after I've done this, I'll come back to you in Spain. And I'm sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessings of the gospel of Christ. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints. In verse 31, he's saying, guys, you will please pray for me. Because I've got to go back to my brethren now. I'm going back to my Israelites. And some of them might not believe that you Gentiles, you uncircumcised people, have taken on this gospel of truth. Some of them, they're not going to believe that I've got I, my job that I'm doing down here among you guys is, is, is righteous. So he's saying, pray for me. I um, and that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints. So he's telling the Romans, he's telling the Spanish people, the people of Macedonia, and all of these people who the saints were and are. So you tell me, now we're living in the 21st century, how this got turned around how the Gentiles are now exalting themselves to be the saints of the Most High God. And then we have the descendants of slavery still suffering social injustices. Children of Jacob, Jacobites. Could it be a possibility that you are supposed to continue in being saints to the most high God, the God that created the heaven and the earth. Could it be possible that because you have still turned your back away from upholding and carrying forth your holy, your duty to be holy, your duty to teach holiness, To perform and show that which is holy in the sight of the Most High God. Why we may have fallen so low from saint to slave. And now we Israelites here, the Israelite nation, are trying to teach restoration. Come back to who you are supposed to be. Do not be fooled or dismayed by these false images that they put into our hearts and our minds. Take them from your hearts. Take them from your mind. And put yourself back into your book. Back into your history book. Because they knew what they were doing. When they wanted to be the superior people, the superior race, to create this superiority complex, they knew that they needed to establish these images, these pictures. How many of you 
How many of you had that picture that we believed and understood to be the Last Supper on your living room wall? How many of you had grandparents with that picture of those 12 disciples with Jesus around that table? And we were told that that was the Last Supper. Never did they tell you that that was the children of Israel keeping the Passover that we keep every year. Verse 31, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judah, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with, with you be refreshed. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Chapter 16, I commended unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is a centuria, that you receive her in the Lord as become of saints, and that you assist her in whatsoever business she have need of you, for she have been a securer of many and of myself also. The reason I just read to you verse 16 is because Paul, Paul, was calling the Gentiles to become saints, to become holy, to become righteous, to become close and near to God. So in verse 16, verse 2, when he, verse 1 to 2, where he's talking about Phoebe, his sister, she's a Gentile. And she's a Gentile who has been faithful onto the things that Paul was teaching the Gentiles. And he said to the Romans that please receive her in the Lord, like accept her because she becometh as saints. She's becoming, she's showing the traits, the virtues of what I will say an Israelite woman. Greet Priscilla, verse 3, and Aquila, my helpers in Jesus Christ, who have for my life laid down their own necks unto whom not only I give thanks, but to all the churches of the Gentiles. So Paul is giving credit and giving thanks to the Gentiles that have stayed with him, who have gone about to teach what they have heard by his words, about Jesus the Christ. Paul has said that that is becoming saintly. That is becoming saintly, saint-like. Do you understand? Saint-like. Now that is coming from an Israelite that can be considered a saint, Paul, even though we know Paul was the least in Israel. So Gentiles were called to be saints, but an Israelite had to call them to be saints. What happens to the Gentile when he's left to his own devices? Who then calls them to be saints? Or do they now run around with that title and start calling A, B, C, D, E persons saints and giving us public holidays for Saint Peter's Day and Saint Valentine's Day. I haven't got long left. I'm going to jump to a scripture, not jump, but move to a scripture. Um, and I will tell you that this is a scripture that was written by a true saint. Even one that goes by the name of Daniel. Israelites, that wasn't our thing. We didn't necessarily call each other saints like that. But yes, Daniel definitely, definitely was close to his God. Definitely was a man of God. So let's see what one of the true saints have to say. And let's look at his prophecy. 
and we can turn to the book of Daniel. Okay. I'd like you to turn to cha Daniel chapter 7, guys, if you can join me. Now we know that Daniel had many dreams and he was trying to really understand the dreams that he was having. And, you know, he, he was definitely a righteous man that went through a lot of trial and tribulation and the Lord was definitely with Daniel. Um, if you really wanna know what saying is, then definitely go with this. But I'm gonna move quickly. It says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, Daniel chapter 13, Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. I'm going to read quickly because I'm short of time. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancients of days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Okay, so he's had a dream about a, a kingdom of people with all sorts of different types of people worshipping him. We know that all nations will serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We teach that. And this kingdom shall not pass away and shall not be destroyed. Verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by, and asked him the truth of all of this. So he's saying, what, what is this vision? So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. These great beasts which are four and four kings which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Daniel's vision is about these four beasts and he's now got the interpretation that there's kings that will rise on this earth, okay? And they'll be exceedingly dreadful. They'd want to devour and break into pieces and stamp out the residue with his feet, okay? But he's saying that the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess it, okay? He said, verse 19, Then I would know the truth of the four beasts which were diverse from all others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails and his brass, which devoured, breaking pieces and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the others which came up, before whom three fell, even of the, the, that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great, whose look was more stout than his fellows, I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints. So this is a description of a beast, a terrible beast of the earth, okay? And they make war with the saints in verse 21. And they prevail against the saints, okay? Until the ancient of days come in verse 22. And judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. So understand that the saints of the Lord who were Israelites, the children, the descendants of slavery, my people, people that look like me, who have my history, okay? There are kings on the earth who seek to destroy us as a people. Now go and look at your history and tell me, have you not been through hell? Have our forefathers not been through hell? This is the things that the saints have been through even today when we look at our history. Thus saith the Lord, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. The fourth beast, the fourth kingdom upon the earth. You think about these powerful countries that we're living in. America, England, China, Israelis, you know, all of these powerful places, and I'll say Israel, but you know, Palestine, all of these things. Look at these countries. And then Look at our position among these nations. Consider what the scripture is talking about when it talks about beasts that are nations. It says in verse 23, thus he said, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall shred down 
and break it in pieces. The ten horns out of his kingdoms are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. Verse 25. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, guys. They will think to change times, they will think to change laws, and they shall be given into his hand into a time and times and the dividing of times. Meaning that the saints, the children of Israel, we will live in a time where kings will be upon the earth and they'll seek to change things. So when you see images like this, when you see customs like Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day, Christmas, when you have saints that don't look like us, these things are all prophesied from the real saint. Even Daniel, a forefather of old, do not be dismayed from saint to slave, now coming back up to recognize who you are and what you're supposed to be, Israel, children of Jacob. Everything is in this history book. Our eyes are now open to the truth. Verse 26, but the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Guys, the kingdom that we are yet to receive and have is an everlasting kingdom kingdom be not dismayed when you look at the history of our people from saints to the descendants of slaves and then you look at the injustices and who we are today praise the god of our forefathers praise the god of abraham the god of isaac the god of jacob praise him in the name of jesus the christ and say thank you lord because we are a nation of people who survive and they want to rob our name in the dirt and keep us low so that we don't speak the things that I'm speaking of today. They fear these words that are coming out of my mouth. Guys, I have two minutes. Two minutes, but I want to just tell you that it says in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2, do I have it here? Do I have it here? Do I have Corinthians 6 verse 2? Yes. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 2. It tells you, Israel, it tells you descendants of slavery. It tells you, dare any of you having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? I'm closing the book. The saints will judge the world. I tell you this day, Abraham was a saint. Moses was a saint. Samuel was a saint. Daniel was a saint. King David was a saint. Deborah was a saint. All of these people that we read about in this Bible, they were the saints of the Most High God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And I don't see no pictures drawn showing what they really look like. I do not see no public holidays commemorating the great things that they did in teaching this gospel of truth. Even Paul, I don't see it. I don't know who St. Francis of Assisi is, but the internet told me so. I don't know who St. Anthony is, but the internet told me so. And I don't know who St. Dominic is, but the internet told me so. 
Let the Gentiles now have their own saints. Let them go about to establish their own saints. That's okay. But may the truth be known that only an Israelite, a teacher of this truth, can be a saint. We were the original saints. If you come into our way of life, you join this religion, and you are of another nation or another ethnicity, yes, you can be considered a saint, 100%. But the saints are of the house of Israel only. Brethren, I want to just thank you so much for listening to what I've had to say today. Any questions, any queries, put it in the comments box and somebody will get back to you and answer the questions. Peace be on to all of you. Thank you for listening. Israel's free under troops, troops.